95.5 KLAQ, El Paso's Best Rock. I'm Daniel Paulus, and we have the utmost pleasure of talking to the legendary guitarist and co-founder of so many bands, Divine Heresy, Bujeria, and of course, Fear Factory, Dino Cazares. Dino, how you doing, bro? I'm doing great. I'm glad to be talking to you today. Uh, uh, I can't wait to go out there to El Paso to go play. So it's going to be great. Yeah, and we're excited to see you guys. This is actually going to be the fifth time that Fear Factory will be in El Paso. And by the way, El Paso, October 9th, wow. Rock House, 9828 Montana. Yeah, fifth time. Is it only five times? I thought it did much more than that. No, it's, uh, well, if I remember at least four times before. And, and I've actually seen you guys in 2013 at the Socorro Entertainment Center. And, and me being such a huge Fear Factory fan, it was such an absolute dream of mine to finally see you guys live. Um, it, it's always been a pleasure to see you guys and listen to your music. I don't know if you remember you guys uh, being here in El Paso, but do you have any memories of playing for the fans or maybe some locations around El Paso from the last time you guys were here? Well, of course, I, I, I always remember the Tex-Mex food, you know, the you know all the you know great tacos and Mexican food I get out there. And of course, the, <laughs> the, fans are, the fans are great out there as well. Um, but, you know, I was just recently there with uh, Soulfly at the Rock House. And it's my first time playing the Rock House, and I believe it's the first time uh, Fear Factor is playing the Rock House. So, you know, I can't wait. Yeah, I believe that's correct, too. Um, and, and I'm glad you brought up Soul Fight, because we are going to get into that uh, just a little bit. And I want to give a quick shout-out to uh, Javier Arriga, who uh, not only is from El Paso, but he actually works as a drum and guitar tech for you guys. And I know he's a very talented musician, too. Yeah, yeah. He's going to be um, actually filling in on, on bass for Tony Campos, who's going to be on tour with Static X. So Javier is actually doing double duty. As I mentioned before, you are a legendary guitarist, and, and I honestly, I would put you guys as one of the first bands to ever really start that industrial metal movement from the late 80s and early 90s, and, and I know the scene of music and metal was so much different back then than it is now. What made you guys want to start something new you know something fresh what was the driving force behind fear factory sound i think just being fans of different types of music you know what i mean it's just wanting to combine all the different things that we liked and just kind of put it in a big melting pot and just seeing what comes out you know these were just the influences that we've had for many years you know growing up you know listening to all different types of music and working in i used to work in a record store here in hollywood and I used to, uh, you know, listen to all this and everything from goth, industrial to, you know, of course, death metal, speed metal, all the different types of music. And uh, just us being fans of all that stuff, you know. And then obviously we're all really into sci-fi, sci-fi movies like Terminator and Blade Runner and stuff like that. And so we kind of themed our whole sound based off, you know, the soundtrack to those movies. And I can definitely hear that sci-fi influence on some of the earlier albums, you know, Soul of a New Machine and Demanufacture, which, um, in my opinion, I think it's hands down one of the greatest albums that I have ever heard. I mean, not just one of the greatest Fear Factory albums, but definitely, in my opinion, it is an absolute must-listen to for any metal fan. I do remember seeing a tweet a while ago. Uh, someone was talking about Hunter Killer, and you said that that's one of your favorite songs. Uh, is that still one of your favorite songs uh, to play live, or are there other songs, you know, in Fear Factory's catalog that you're like, dude, we gotta play this song, man. We just gotta. Yes. Um, well, you know, we, we we definitely stick to a lot of the hits that you know that people know, um, but we throw a lot of you know rare songs in there. Actually, one of my one of my favorite songs right now. It kind of changes. You know what I mean? It kind of changes. But one of my favorite songs right now. It's actually the title track to our third record. It's called Obsolete, oh. right? And yeah, and so we played Obsolete like the last uh, show that we played at the Milwaukee at the uh, I'm sorry, the Metal Injection Festival that happened here in Anaheim. Um, we played the song Obsolete, and I was like, wow, we haven't played this song since 1999, and it was like, wow, I really like this song right now. So it kind of it kind of changes as uh, uh, you know over the years. 
No, I love that obsolete album. In fact, I think that was one of the first songs, uh, first albums I ever heard from you guys, especially Shock. Like that opening riff. It's just, it, it, it struck a nerve with nine year old Daniel back in 1999. I was like, wow, this is just, I'm oh, sorry, six year old Daniel. I was six years old when that album came wow. out. So it, it, for me, it, it has been a, such a huge influence uh, to my musical taste, big time. Do you ever, you know, get like weird stories like that, you know, from fans back then? Like, oh my God, you guys have, you know, changed my life. And if you do, how does that make you feel being in the business for so long? Well, you know, I, I really like the fact that, you know, our music is able to, you know, provoke, you know, a, a life changing experience or, you know, anything that just, you know, makes people happy. You know, we're, we're just excited to, to create this music and, you know, have this platform for people to listen to it and, you know, get whatever they can get out of it. You know what I mean? It really makes us happy. Um, but we do definitely hear a lot of things where, you know, people who might have been, um, you know, suicidal and they, and, you know, our music has helped them to not take their own lives, which is it's a pretty heavy subject, you know, um, but, you know, it's kind of a, it, you know, it, it totally blows my mind that we're able to, you know, the music is able to like, you know, provoke people not to do that. You know what I mean? And especially like, like a song like Resurrection, you know what I mean? It's, it's a very uplifting song and and it's a very emotional song. And it, sometimes it really hits people emotionally in that way. You know what I mean? And some people, you know, I, I hear a lot of stuff like, you know, you know, I used, I used to listen to, I used to listen to you during high school and it really got me through my high school years. You know what I mean? Um, you're like the soundtrack of my high school and I love it, you know? And, um, and I hear a lot of stuff like, you know, Hey, you know, uh, guys who have kids, you know, parents who have kids, like, well, you know, I, I used to listen to you in high school, and I turned my kid on to you, on to you guys. You know, he's 10 years old now, and he's going to come to the concert with me. You know, so we hear, we hear a lot of different stuff like that. And, you know, music is such a powerful thing. Um, it, it means so much to everyone. It, it has a different um, feeling to everybody. So that experience is unique no matter who you talk to. So the fact that so yeah. many people have that positive feeling with you guys, that's that's what it's all about, man. Correct. And you know what? It, it's not just fans who listen to our music, but it, me too. You know what I mean? It affects me that way as well. You know what I mean? And uh, sometimes, you know, a lot of the stuff that we sing about, or even just, just the riffs that I write, uh, you know, also, you know, um, you know, help me get through things as well. You know what I mean? Like I could have gone through a breakup or some sort of, uh, you know, lawsuit or anything like that. You know, some music will always carry me and help me get past those bad times. Absolutely, man. And, you know, we've been talking a lot about Fear Factory. I mean, and, you know, you're you're the co-founder of Fear Factory. You've been in the band for, oh, say, maybe three years or so. <laughs> Probably like 30 <laughs> years. So, obviously, Fear Factory is such a huge part of your life. But that wasn't the only band that you have had a hand with starting. You know, Divine Heresy, Buheria. And as you mentioned before, you've worked with uh, Soulfly. Do you ever uh, throw in any of their songs when you play Fear Factory shows, or do you just kind of keep them separated? Um, like, if you're doing a Fear Factory show, we're just going to do Fear Factory songs. Yeah, well, when we do Fear Factory shows, I definitely do do Fear Factory songs. We have we have ten albums, you know what I mean? So I got a lot of songs to choose from. But you know, when I when I have my other band called Asasino, which is me and Tony Campos from Static X, um, we you know do Brujeria songs with that, you know. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't bring any other of my uh, projects into Fear Factory at all whatsoever. I try to keep them pretty separated. That's, that's fair. And you, you know, like I said, you know, ten albums of Fear Factory. You definitely have a lot of, you know, ammo in your arsenal. So just in case you need to throw in a, a song or two, it's like, oh yeah, we got plenty of songs. Yeah, we got we got a lot of songs to choose from, and and people want it. You know, they let us know every day what songs they want to hear. You know what I mean? So. We uh, we try to accommodate everybody, and uh, you know it's going to be a collection of some of the greatest songs that we've ever wrote and written, and, um, and you know, and, and a few deep cuts. I'm not sure if I asked this earlier, but are there any songs that you have played that you just never get tired of? You know, you know, someone wants to say, uh, let's just say, uh, demanufacture or replica, and you're like, let's do it. I'm down. Well, 
honestly, I never get tired of any of my songs. Um, I, I love playing the songs that I created, and 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 I, you know, it, it like I said, it still provokes a, a, a positive feeling for me, and sometimes it, it reminds me of a place and time where I was at. But I never get tired of playing my music or listening to my music. Uh, I I don't know if that sounds you know egotistical or what, but I mean I just I I mean I write it because I like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I write it because I love it. Of course. And I, I, I like the fact that you know it, it it has that effect on other people. Of course, and you know, it, I know you've been a legendary guitarist, and and there's a fact that I don't think a lot of people really know about, but you were one of the first guitarists to start using seven and eight string guitars. Do you remember the first song you ever learned on a you know, well a more than six string guitar? Um. No, because back then there wasn't a lot of people playing that stuff to be, you know, influenced by, because no one was really playing those guitars at that time. Um, you know, there's really only, I can list like maybe three or four bands, right? Um, like Trey from Morbid Angel, he was a guitar player from Morbid Angel. He was playing some seven strings back in the, uh, in about 94. And then, of course, you know, the Sugar guys were playing, you know, those uh, seven strings as well, and Steve Vai, and then and then myself, and that was really about it. So there wasn't really nothing to learn from. You know what I mean? Yeah, you just so kind of like created your own music out of it. So you're pretty much, you know, definitely a trendsetter with helping industrial metal be part of the the '90s culture, and you know, for the metal culture too, with adding this new sound that really not too many guys were experimenting with. But you know, nowadays metal bands. They gotta have seven, eight, nine, ten string guitars. So, I definitely Correct. say that that definitely was a trend sending. Yeah, we were we were one of the bands that that, that definitely helped uh, shape you know where the seven string and eight string guitar went. Of course, for sure. You know, of course, like you know bands like Corn and Meshuga and, and and even like Limp Bizkit later on, they were using some seven strings. Um, you know, but there wasn't a lot of bands during that time that, that were really doing that, and, and then it, then. So somewhere in the late nineties it kinda of got really popular and then it boom, it just blew up after that. You know, now it's just now it's become a standard for, you know, a lot of music today, you know, seven string guitars. But yeah, we were one of the bands in the nineties to really uh, help influence that new wave and um we were also we were also survivors in a way because, you know, a lot of bands disappeared when you know you know, when the whole grunge movie came came in, when Nirvana came in kind of killed a lot of bands but you know we were able to survive and you know bands like us and pantera and a few other bands they were able to survive that whole new wave of music that was coming out yeah and that, that 90s metal scene was uh it was a little weird a little interesting to say the least but yeah you definitely and, and the whole guys from fear factory and so many other bands they were definitely able to keep their horns held high and wave the flag for metal so that's that's definitely important to remember and it's also it's also important to remember that you know you're a legendary guitarist, but we know that music is not that's not your only focus in life. I know that there's you know so many things that drive musicians to to stay creative. What are some hobbies of yours that that you like to do outside of music? Um, I I don't really have a lot of time for other hobbies to be honest with you. I mean, my main focus is like usually when I'm not creating music is just spending time with my family. And friends, and to be honest with you, that's really all I have time for. And the rest of it is just music because music is my life. It's in my heart. It's in my blood. This is what I love doing. That's definitely fair. That's a that's a great answer. Like, well, my family keeps me going, and that's that's a great answer. And I know we're yeah. getting uh, we're we're getting kind of close to uh, wrapping up our time here, but I did want to ask. I know the last studio album Fear Factory put out was back in 2021, Aggression Continuum. And obviously, uh -huh. you guys aren't showing any signs of stopping because you just put out the reindustrialized album back in June of this year. So, without getting you know into too much detail, without giving too much of a way, what else can fans get excited for in regards to Fear Factory in the future? Well, in the future, we're definitely going to be doing a new record early next year and have it out um, sometime mid mid next year. Um, you know, and we will, we will continue the theme of what Fear Factory is about, the relationship between, you know, man and, man and technology and where, where that's going to take us. Because now, now we have a whole new influx of 
AI and how much AI is affecting change in our day-to-day life. I mean, you see all the the strikes over here in, in Los Angeles, you know, the writer strike, and then now there's going to be actors in the video game uh, industry who are going to be uh, also striking as well. So it's going to get crazy because AI is definitely changing uh, where where we are headed as people, and, and just you know, it's ever since our obsolete record, we've always been talking about change. We've always been talking about how certain things, because of technology, is going to become obsolete. So it's really interesting to see what's going to happen with the movie industry and the video industry, video game industry to see where that's going to go. Um, and that's kind of like what we're going to be singing about in our in our uh, new record, just where AI is going to take us and how it's going to affect us in our day to day lives. So we'll see. You know, we'll see where this goes. Well, I'm excited to hear new stuff from you guys. I'm always excited whenever I see you know announcement of Fear Factory. You know, announce this new single. I I think I speak for every Fear Factory fan when we cannot wait to hear some new music, and we certainly cannot wait to see you guys October 9th at the Rock House here in El Paso. And before I let you go, before I let you go back to shredding, and I know that's what you're probably doing before we started doing our phone call, is there anything that you want to say to all the Fear Factory fans that are listening in right now? I definitely want to say thank you for the 32 years of supporting Fear Factory. And, you know, we are uh, extremely excited still to be out there today and performing in front of all you fans. And uh, we, we, we love and, and appreciate the support. And please come out to the shows and, uh, you know, support metal music. Thank you so much, Dino. I really appreciate your time, man. Go see Fear Factory October 9th at the Rock House, 9820 Montana. I will certainly be there. Dino, thank you very much, man. And I hope you have a kick-ass day, bro. Thank you, man. I appreciate it.